We next have Michael McCullough. Michael had a brain hemorrhage at birth, which forced him to relearn how to talk after brain surgery at age 10. Throughout his teens and his 20s, he found some interesting approaches to improve his speech, such as doing stand-up comedy, using accents, uh, and advanced meditation techniques. He turned this challenge into an enduring interest in the brain, and that's the reason why we are all here today at BrainMind. Michael is an entrepreneur in residence at Greylock Partners, having founded 11 sex successful companies, eight of them nonprofits. Michael co-founded QuestBridge, which sends about half of the low-income students to the top uh, 35 colleges in the US, all while also being an ER trauma doctor and professor of emergency medicine at UCSF, where he still does uh, clinical shifts for free. He also happens to occasionally be on call for the Dalai Lama as his personal emergency physician. Michael is a medical and tech investor of note as well, having built two major medical funds. I've known him for 10 years. Uh, he's a great mentor and a friend to me. It is my pleasure to introduce Michael McCullough. That's my twin brother, and that's me. Can anyone tell the a difference be between our heads? Mine's way too big, and it looks like I'm an alcohol in that picture. Right there. Yeah. Right. But uh, so he had a normal brain eye hemorrhage at birth and had hydrocephalus. This is the first a selfie I took when I was 10 years old, when my mom was out of the room, and I was uh, shunted. So when I speak in public, sometimes my throat will seize, and having speech impediments kind of like having a, a cramp in your calf, only it's your throat. So when you have like an almost cramp, you don't you move a certain way. It's like M's and a K's and a G's, not good for me. So you know, Michael McCullough was not a good name to give me as a kid. <laughs> <laughs> we all believe that there's kind of a revolution happening in the brain akin to what happened with genetics and peering into the atom. If we get this wrong, we could really go the wrong way. I mean, so we, we're talking about all the upside things here, and I'm an optimist as well, but with less capacity in the past, we would do things like frontal lobotomies or over drug young people with Ritalin and things like that. So our capacities will be increasing to learn and flourish, but also to harm as well. So on that note, who recognizes this man? He's important because his name was Ernest Asalve, and he was an industrialist, much like many of you here in the room right now. And he organized the first Solve conference that brought Einstein and Niels Bohr and other scientists together years ago. So I, I'd like to think of a brain mind as kind of trying to do the same thing, only because of things happening in industry, it's not enough to just to get all the scientists all put together to make anything happen. So we essentially need a, a flywheel to get made. And we're hoping to present an area in BrainMind for those people to all come together. It's hard for entrepreneurs to identify the scientists, scientists to identify alternative forms of, of funding, to attract people to maybe work for the a company who are mission driven, who in turn need to identify the science. So it, it's a looping effect of a bunch of well-intentioned people who aren't connected to each other yet. And that's where things are actually happening here. And I'll run through that today where we have all kinds of capital, all kinds of goodwill, all kinds of wonderful ideas, but they're not kind of organized in the right way at a, a, a macro level. So it's particularly important today to involve industry because a lot of the science is not happening in the lab anymore. We have had moonshots that worked. Some of them were just irrationally good things for humanity. So what I'm proposing isn't a specific moonshot, it's more like a flywheel to, to quit thinking of impact investing on a company level Think of it on a, a sector level. So about a year and a half ago, I began to collect the uh, tribes together. Reed's got a group of people that he works with, but kind of the entrepreneurial uh, tribes out there, who all kind of know each other, actually. And uh, your academics all know each other. And these groups kind of put them all together into one place. And then uh, Tom, where's Tom? There's Tom. We actually met over the educational work in a, a cardiac diagnostic. And so when I, I quit my fund to do this, as have the co-founders, I talked to Tom for about three and a half hours and said, is this a thesis correct? Because I'm about to leave you know, my fund to actually go do it. And he said, yeah, it's correct, only it's hard. Because you have to get a lot of people together. You have to not boil the ocean. You have to focus on the right things at the right time to make them all happen. So I gave all my carry in my fund. We made a brain mine with help of Juan and a host of others. First major new pilot launch was in September of this year. We had some of the best scientists in the room, the best investors in the room. 
Those here are all pictures of people who are either in the ecosystem in the room here today or at the Stanford conference. Altogether, we have about 1,000 people in what I'll call the ecosystem. Now, at any one conference, we can't keep infinitely growing the number of attendees, so we'll be filtering it by who's supporting the overall mission the most, who's making the flywheel a turn. So if you're coming as an angel investor, you ought to angel invest at some point in time. If you're coming to help operate a company, you should help operate a company. If you're a scientist, you should have something on the you know, roadmap. Or think of how you can contribute. A lot of you were actually invited here today, not because you're, say, the operator yourself, but you're highly networked individuals. There'll probably come a time when we don't have this bunch of network people in the room and actually have operators in the room, but we design the ecosystem itself to be able to always have a, a, a role for people going forward, essentially. And I'll go through that here today. We had about 100, and, 100 150 a billion of people in the room in Stanford. And we came up with kind of the following three things to do. So one of them is to take the academic meadow, where people are competing over funding, not cooperating that much, and try to leverage the philanthropic influence to put those ideas on what I'll call a roadmap and a filter. So Tom just talked about the filter. So that would be things that have outsized you know, leverage impact for humanity. The roadmap would be things like what is absolutely needed. So what we'd like to do first is to turn an academic meadow into more of like a hydroponic garden, essentially. So let's review what's happening today. We spend about $210 billion a year creating ideas in medical science. About almost 40 from philanthropy, the rest from the government. Tom already talked about the fact that we at Baymine are not the experts in the room on, on almost anything here. I'm an ER physician in a, a trauma center, which means my ego structure is I'm not the expert on anything. If there's an eye problem, I'll call an ophthalmologist. But we're responsible for the patient. So Bain Mind itself will be more aggregating expertise around the table than trying to develop every expertise essentially ourselves. But some things we came up with when we spoke to the uh, heads of the Obama's uh, Brain Initiative was things like, well, we need to know the circuits, which means by definition we need to have the equipment to know the circuits. Now, if we just even halt there, the equipment to know a neural circuit is in an academic market. It's a small market and probably a non-adventurable investment. Essentially, if you look at the valley of death, it's where most of the value actually ought to be, right? Because if, if a venture-backable investment, let's say it's you want in a thousand investments you see when I was a venture capitalist, you end up making an investment in, it both hopefully will have an impact and have a real a product, but also have a high economic return, which means there's probably, what, you know, eight to nine for the investors in the room, investments which could return capital or could break even, with an impactful a thesis that aren't being supported. How many of you are investors in the room? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a painful to see a, a company that you know could succeed and thrive and could help humanity but wouldn't meet your 8x, you know, 8x return. Now, what we're hoping to do is, is to take the venture capitals into the system and use that expertise to partner with a philanthropy at the same time so they can all work together on that. So the current system of everything aiming at a venture mountain top is clearly incomplete. I, I did a, a cardiac diagnostic, and when I looked at that field, it's kind of crazy. So it's the number one illness of our, of our species. For half of men, the first presenting symptom is of a cardiac disease is a death, and that's true for two-thirds of women. And yet Lipitor, the Lipitor, you need to treat 300 people to save one heart attack. It's almost a gimmick that everyone's cholesterol is lowered, but the real outcome measure you're concerned about is, is a heart attack actually a saved or not? Yet, we know more about nutrition and diabetes than we've ever known, and we have more diabetics and obese people than we've ever had. And a, a company that helps people lose weight is often requires human coaching, which by definition is a non-leverageable investment in a, you know, a software. So we're just ignoring a lot of our best ideas in our biggest organ system. So when that a company did okay, I, I thought, well, it's the biggest dislocation I've seen is this dislocation I'm seeing. That, that you have the, all this money spent in academia, and then, then the uh, companies try to squeeze themselves into a venture model in order to get support. You know, you know, it's nuts. Now, fortunately, all the mechanisms to fix that are already in the system. All of the energies are there. So, so if you think about the things you'd have to do to, fi to fix or repair or uh, traverse the uh, valley of uh, death, you'd have to replace anything for which economics had an influence. 
You need to place how you get the capital. You need to place leadership and what they were motivated by. You might need to have an alternative, a structure, and how the opportunities are a filter. You've got, on the one side, a lot of money being spent by, by philanthropists. And the a program money a, can be invested in a for-profit company. It's just a, culturally, it's not often actually done. We'll go through those mechanisms. So 40 a billion of program money, the 5% you know, mandated a giveaway money a year, is in the system already. On the other side, you have investors who need to have a higher return. And I don't fault a venture at all in this. They wouldn't have a venture fund if they didn't get the returns that they're actually looking for. So if philanthropy can move this way, they can begin to kind of uh, cover the gap. Now, to remind people of just how much money that is, OK, so there's like a 5% mandate that you have to give away a year. It's about $38 billion in healthcare science. But you can invest out of your endowment as well. So depending on how, how you, you want to account it, that's say a trillion dollars of accessible capital, plus 120 billion of donor advised funds, which are not mandated to be invested. Some people kind of brag about how much they have in their donor advised fund, and they're not mandated to invest it, so it never actually shrinks. So if we could bring impact investing the other way, at the same time as bringing them together in terms of the capital, all the capital is there in surplus. I also have a pet peeve, first time I'll talk about it on, on a stage. I think we should divide impact investing into investor-focused impact investing, where you're claiming to get you know, venture-like returns, and impact-oriented impact investing, where if you return the capital, that ought to be enough. Now, I, I would even say really good impact investors who are investor-focused could get venture-like returns. But by definition, they will be ignoring investments with between a 1x and a 3x, where most of the impact actually happens, ironically. So being an investor-focused impact investor, and I, I was one of those when I had a fund. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't claim, though, that we weren't ignoring investments that could help people that didn't have the economic return. So if you want to continue to participate in the future, please come with the instruments you have to support moving the field forward, essentially. This isn't an only like a spectator type of an event. I'd like to also honor Calvin, what was Calvin, and Diana, would you stand up? Who, who quit their jobs. <laughs> who, who quit their jobs on an idea with me a year and a half ago. And uh, Calvin was in my uh, fund with me. And we gave back all of our uh, carry to do this. Both of them have worked without a pay for a year and a half. So I just, I just want to show you the, uh, the you know, uh, a dedication of the people that we have here in the room. So if I could have a round of applause for them, I would be good. <laughs> Hopefully it will not be forever without pay. Just for this year, it was without pay. But, but, uh, so on that note, we have a lot to get done and a lot to think about. And uh, thank you all for uh, coming today and for participating in this overall vision. Thank you for coming.